All right, so we're in chapter 61, The Factors of Regression. I'm just going to continue on reading this book. I don't know why I'm interested in reading it, finishing it up since I've read it already, but it's been several years. Something that God is maybe trying to get me to see. Um, now we're on regression. And I'm telling you, this is what we're doing in our society. We have regressed. So this is a little understanding in the clinical sense of what regression is. The persistent pattern of maladaptation at personality levels, the ostensible purposelessness of many self-damaging acts defiantly suggest not only a lack of strong purpose, but also a vague negative purpose or at least a negative drift. This sort of patient, despite all his opportunities, his intelligence, and his playing lessons of experience, seems to go out of his way to woo misfortune. The suggestion has already have been made that his typical activities seem less comprehensible in terms of life strivings of a pursuit of joy than as an unrecognized blundering toward the negation of non-existence. Some of this, it has been suggested, may be interpreted as the tantrum-like reactions of an inadequate personality balked as behaviors similar to that of a spoiled child who bumps his head against the wall or holds his breath when he is crossed. It might be thought of as not unlike the cutting off of one's nose to spite not only one's face, but also the scheme of life in general, which has turned out to be a game that one cannot play. Such reactions are, of course, found in nearly all types of personality disorders or inadequacy. It will perhaps be readily granted that they are all regressive behavior against the constructive patterns, hence he says constructive patterns, through which the personality finds expression and one might say seek fulfillment of its destiny is regressive activity, though it may not consist in a return step by step or in a partial return to the status of childhood and eventually of infancy. Such reactions appear to be, in a sense, against the grain of life or against the general biologic purpose. Because it's fallen out of this behavioral constructive patterns. Regressive reactions or processes may all be regarded as disintegrative, as reverse steps in the general process of biologic growth through which a living entity becomes more complex, more highly adapted and specialized, better coordinated, more capable of dealing successfully or happily with objective or subjective experiences. One may find that this scale of increasing complexity at points even below the level of living matter. A group of electrons functioning together make up the atoms, which can indeed be split down again to its components. The atoms joining from molecular molecules, which in turn coming together in definite orderly arrangements may become structurally coordinating parts of elaborate crystalline materials or in even more specialized and complex fashion, a cell of organic matter. Always the process is reversible. The organic matter can decompose back into the inorganic matter. Cells of organic matter in an immensely more complicated and integrated union of structure and functions are seen in the common jellyfish. Just follow him where he's going with this. <laughs> Without laborers following out the steps of this scale, we might mention the increasing scope of activity, the increasing specialization, the increasing precariousness of existence at various levels up through vertebrae and mammals to man. All along this scale, one finds that failure to function successfully at a certain level necessitates regression or decomposition to a lower or less complicated one. Okay, this is going to apply to humans as well. 
If the cell membrane of one epithelial unit in a mammalian body becomes imporous, imporous means impenetrable, and fails to obtain nutriment brought by blood and lymph, it loses its existence as an epithelial cell. If the unwary rabbit fails to perceive the danger of the snare, he soon becomes in rapid succession a dead rabbit, merely a collection of dead organs and supported structures, protein, fats, etc., and finally inorganic matter. The fundamental quest for life has been interrupted, and having been interrupted, the process goes into reverse. So to criminal discovered so too the criminal discovered and imprisoned ceases to be a free man who comes and goes as he pleases a curtailment in the scope of his functioning is suffered a regression in one sense to simpler more routine and less varied and vivid activities the man who fails in another and more complex way to go on with life to fulfill his personality growth and function becomes what we call a schizophrenic. The objective curtailment of this activity by the rules of the psychiatric hospitals are also negligible in comparison with the vast simplifications, the loss of self-expression and the personal disintegration which characterizes his regressions from the subjective point of view. The old practice of referring to the extremely regressed schizophrenic as leading to vegetative existence implies the significance that is being stressed. Regression, then, in a broad sense, may be taken to mean movement from richer to more full life to levels of scantier or less highly developed life. In other words, it is relative death. It is the succession of existence or maintenance of function at a given level. The conception of an act of death instincts postulates by Freud has been utilized by some to account for socially self-destructive reactions, whether such a disintegrative force is indeed active within the biologic unit and dis intrinsically purpose purposive Propulsive means intentional or not. An unraveling of growth, reversals of forward strivings, etc., are familiar. The tendency to disintegrate against which life evolves may be regarded as more fundamental and less personal, as somewhat comparable to gravity. The climbing man or animal must use force and purpose to ascend or to maintain himself at a given height. To fall or slide downward, he needs only cease his effort and let it go. Without assuming an intrinsic death instinct, one can still account for active withdrawal from positions at which adaptation is unsuccessful and stress too extreme. Can you think where adaptation is unsuccessful and stress too extreme in our environments. Where the regression occurs primarily through something like gravity or through impulses more self-contained, the backward movement or ebbing is likely to prompt many sorts of secondary reactions, okay? Behaviors not adapted for ordinary human purposes. Okay, so it's now creating a, a, a divergent or some type of maneuver around all of this stress now. But it's not adaptive, but natural selection is picking it up anyways. And this is going to be for his function is in the other direction. The modes of such reactivity may vary, fall into complex patterns and seek elaborate expressions. Or a neuroses. This is what we're developing as a result of this maladaptive behaviors doing due to the original stimulus. And a movement from levels where life is vigorous and full to those where it is less so, the tactic of withdrawal predominates. People with all the outer mechanisms of adaptation intact can, one surmises, regress more complexly 
than can those who react more simply. The simplest reaction in reverse might be found in one who straight, straight away blows out his brains as a skillful general who has realized that the objective is unattainable withdraws his bank and utilizes all sorts of delay in action. So a patient who has much of the outer mechanisms for living many retire, not an obvious route, but skillfully and elaborately preserving his lines. The psychopath has, as we conceive of him in such an interpretation seems to justify the high estimate of his technical abilities as we seem expressed in reverse movement. Unlike the general with the retreating army in our analogy, he seems not st still devoted to the original contest, but to other issues and aims that arise in withdrawal. To force the analogy further, we might say that the retiring army is now concerning itself with looting the countryside, seeking mischief and light entertainment, etc. He has cast off his original loyalties, but has found no other place to replace them. F. L. Wells has expressed things very pertinent in the present discussion. A brief quotation will bring out useful points." End quote. The principle of intuitive reactions, sublimative or regressive in character, has long been known, but Kurt Lewis' experimental construction of the latter is especially apt, if not unquestionable, mental hygiene. A child, for example, continually impels to open a gate it is impossible for him to open, may blow up in a tantrum, growl on the ground to the emotion subsides subsequently, subs sufficiently for him to become substitutively occupied as with fragments of gravel and other detritus he finds there by which he forgets his distress about the gate. Lewin, perhaps unaware of the status of this in a live observation in psychiatric history, gives it the same going out of the field. The background is that enunciated by Woodworth and by James before him, not to say Adolf Mayer, Janet Jung, and psychoanalytic groups generally, the human personality has the adaptive pro property of finding satisfactions at simpler levels when higher ones are taken away. Fortunately, so if this keeps him out of a psychosis, otherwise, if it is stabilizes him in content, con in contentment at this lower level, and they're calling this going native, or if the satisfaction cannot be found short of a psychosis. All such cases have the common regressive factors of giving up the higher level adjustment with regressive relief at a lower level. Another illustration gives by Wells emphasizes features of the concept that are vulnerable, valuable to us. End quote. Consider, for example, the group of drives that center around the concept of self maintenance, the living standards of civilization. This means the pursuit of the divers means to surround oneself with the maximum of material comforts in terms of residence, food, playthings, etc., for the purpose of which one can capitalize his abilities. That the normal individual will do this to a liberal limit is taken to the local culture as a matter of course, probably more liberally than the facts justify. For well, this pursuit involves a competitive struggle beset also with inner conflicts, which by no means everyone is able to set aside. Among regressives specific to this category are those undertakings of poverty common to religious orders. But this regression is quite specific. He's calling religion regression. 
pay attention. Among regressions specific to these categories, to this category, and the category I'm referring to is the pursuit involves a competitive struggle beset also with inner conflicts. These inner conflicts are ethical, he put in quotation marks, which by no means everyone is able to set aside these conflicts. But what will reinforce this among regressions specific to this category are those undertakings of poverty common to religious orders. Why, why is he referring to religious orders poverty? Because it's a form of regression of man's capacities and abilities because it's limiting you. Just think about it in this term. I'm not trying to demonize religion, but this regression is quite specific since these orders often involve their members and other disciplines from which the normal individual would flee as far. It is quite certain though, hard to demonstrate objectively that many individuals in normal life regresses from these economic conflicts only in less degree. He does not take the vow of poverty like the monastic or does he dedicate himself to the simplified life of the South Sea Island stereotype, but he prefers sal salary to commission, city apartments to suburban bungalows, clerical work to a thought expressed to outside. A thought expressed by William James in 1902 and quoted by Wells deserves renewed attention, end quote. Yonder Ponder Yellow, however, whom everyone can beat suffers no Am I going to read this? Let me just read it. Yonder puny fellow, however, whom everyone can beat, suffers no chagrin about it, for he has long ago abandoned the attempt to carry that line, as the merchants say of self at all. With no attempt, there can be no failure. With no failure, no humiliation. So our self-feeling is this world depends entirely on what we back ourselves to be and do. It is determined by the ratio of our actualities to our supposed potentialities. A fraction of which our pretensions are the dominator and the numerator are success. Thus self-esteem equals success pretensions. Such a fraction may be increased as well as diminishing the denominator as by increasing the, the numerator. To give up pretensions is as blessed a relief as to get them gratified. And where disappointment is incessant and the struggle unending, this is what men will always do. The history of evangelical theology with its conviction of sin, its self-despair and its abandonments of salvation by works in the deepest of possible examples, but we met others in every walk of life. How pleasant is the day when we give up striving to be young or slender. Thank God we say those illusions are gone. Everything added to the self is a burden as well as pride. End quote. Something relevant to the point not under consideration may be found also in Sheraton's comment on reactions against unbearable pain or stress in the human organism. He says, end quote, again, in life's final struggle, the chemical delicacy of the brain net can make distress lapse early because with the brain's disintegrating, the mind fades early, a rough world's mercy towards its dearest possession, end quote. There are, it seems, many ways for this to occur without signs of any change, which meant we yet have objective means to detect chemically or microscopically. Such changes may occur under the stimulus of agent that do not have direct physical contact with the brain or with any other part of the body. Withdrawal 
or limitation of one's quest in living appears many in many forms. Though the decision for taking such a step may be conscious, voluntary, it seems likely that many influences less clear and simple also play a part. In the earliest years of human life, a great deal of complicated shaping must occur with adaptative changes to promote survival by an automatic refusal or inability to risk one's feelings in the greatest objective adventure. In a, an adult life, such decisions sometimes emerge in clear deliberation. A man seen many years ago needed and sought understanding from his wife in a relation which, for many reasons, they had not been able to achieve. None of these problems were related to those of the psychopath. Had he had little, a little more like these patients, the particular disappointment, loneliness, and distress which influenced him could never have arisen. In a note, he refers to a recent failure to which our to, to a failure to reach her after some years of complexly emotional alienation, he says in quote. Two things emerged in my awareness after an hour of outward harmony, of nothing but conciliatory affection in her words or in mine. Conciliatory means intended to gain goodwill or favor or reduce hostility. So he's referring to a letter, this psychopath that he had with this woman that he is beloved. He says, two things emerged in my awareness after an hour of outward harmony, of nothing but conciliatory affection in her words or in mine. The way her mind closed automatically at the only point possible for me to enter. The total absence of cruelty or even of intention in the response that settled the issue. I cannot endure that again. I can make myself believe that it doesn't matter. I will live myself by myself and nothing will hurt me anymore. I apologize for counseling the appointment. I guess he was making this to the doctor who was trying to see him. Such words standing apart from the situation convey little or nothing of the distress from which the person withdrew. Perhaps they will illustrate the act of turning away. The activity of the psychopath too dramatically perhaps might be called the kind of protracted and elaborate social and spiritual suicide. From this point of view, his behavior suggests that he finds greater and more desirable accomplishments or reliefs in this regressive process that is offered by such an act as promptly killing himself the more complex, sustained, and in many respects, more spectacular undoing of the self may become very dear to him, for the seldom allows physical suicide to interrupt it. Be it noted that such a person retains high intelligence and nearly all the outer mechanisms for carrying on the complicated activities of positive life. It is to be effected, expected that this, that his endeavors in the opposite regressive emotional direction will be more subtle and far-reaching than those of a less highly developed psychobiologic apparatus. The average rooster proceeds at once a leap of the nearest hen and have done with its simple erotic impulses. The complex human lover may pay suit for years in its love object, approaching her through many volumes of poetry, through the building up of a financial security in his business through manifold activities and operations of his personality functions and with aim and emotional comparabilities more complicated and more profound than that of the rooster. With all of these functions working in reverse, he's centrally motivated by the impulse or the gravitational toward related non-life. The patient with semantic disabilities woos disintegration with similar deliberations and elaborateness, his conscious or outer functioning, maintaining an imitation of life that is uniquely deceptive. <laughs> and that is the end of that chapter. I'm going to start a new chapter on interpersonal influences moving forward.